um, melodies. Not every composer gives big melodies to the brass, you know? Beethoven doesn't, really. Mozart doesn't. You know, in earlier music, the brass was used, along with the timpani, for punctuation at the, at the most important dividing lines or climaxes the brass would end. But Wagner, it's absolutely normal to have the brass play entire melodies. Let's listen to the beginning of the overture to the Flying Dutchman. If you were a trumpet player or a horn player or a trombone player or a tuba player, you'd want to play this music. And our brass section is in heaven doing this piece. Um, also, we felt that it would be a great opener for a season. The way it opens with the, uh, this, the huge chord, especially from the strings playing tremolo as fast as they can. Like that. And it, it, it really grabs your attention. So what a way to kick off the season. And that's the main reason why we opened the concert, where we're opening the concert with that, because in other respects, it doesn't have too much to do with the rest of the music on the program. I love to program thematically and put pieces together that make sense together. And that one is maybe a bit of an outlier for this program, because the other three pieces are extraordinarily uh, connected. You have uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, you have the Ravel Piano Concerto, which is very much influenced by Rhapsody in Blue. So it was almost, if you can imagine, a Parisian being influenced by America. A Parisian in America, so to speak. And then we're playing an American in Paris. And so all of those perfectly fit together. Um, the first of the concertos that we'll be doing is the second of them to be written. Um, Ravel was very influenced by American jazz. Um, and a lot of Europeans were in the 1920s and 30s, influenced by American jazz, and in their own way, um, translated it into their own sensibilities. So uh, the jazz gestures or the jazz uh, characteristics that you hear in French music of the 20s and 30s are very different from the way you would hear them in America. But uh, you can, there's no doubt that um, the Ravel Piano Concerto in G would never have existed in the form that it's in if not for Rhapsody in Blue. But let's, before we play anything, because Aldo's going to play a couple licks for us, I think people would be very interested to know about you, where you came from, and all of that. Sure. Tell us. Well, um, I am from Cuba. I'm a Cuban native. I live in Cuba. I was born there, raised there, studied there for a long time. And um, my family is... Uh, all mu musical family. There is a, a conductor, a piano teacher, a violinist, a guitarist, a clarinetist, <laughs> a choir conductor, and my daughter's now guitar and flute. Um, <laughs> so it's like a full ensemble <laughs> family. Um, so yes, um, since very early I was uh, into music. I started. Uh, I started playing piano and messing around with the piano around four four years old, and um, I started officially uh, receiving piano lessons, uh, music lessons in the elementary school for musicians, for kids that like music, when I was seven years old. Uh, well, I spent all my life uh, studying music. Uh, besides that, um, I also was uh, interested in composing, improvising. 
So it was like a dual thing, learning the academic classical repertoire on technique and jamming, improvising, <laughs> composing, and sometimes making my own pieces for the academic exams. So that was kind of a, a, a dual thing, right? So after that, I graduated from the, <clears throat> the conservatory when I was 19, music uh, conservatory Amadeo Roldan in Havana. And um, I was offered, well, I was offered not. I had the opportunity to travel to London. That's why my English is so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You can hear that accent, yeah. Um, and um, I performed there for um, the um, Royal Festival Hall, Concert Hall, um, among other Cuban artists at that time, Bonavista Social Club, I presume you understand who, what they are. And um, anyways, that was my opportunity to go there and I took that chance and auditioned in every <laughs> possible university or college of music there. <laughs> And uh, yes, I was given a full scholarship to study four years there, my college um, degree um, in Trinity, Trinity College of Music, um, in classical music, by the way. But beside that, I could have many other influences, and uh, I went to listen to all kind of music and culture uh, events. So that was very, very important, and it really did change my life for good. Although the other part of it that it was away from home, away from family, and that also is uh, part of growing up and getting to be yourself, right? But um, I don't think uh, most Cubans have these kind of opportunities to do that. So I feel very lucky in that way. Um, you, it's interesting you talk about your musical family. I didn't realize until two days ago that I had actually worked with Aldo's brother before. Um, Aldo's brother, Ilmar, who's going to be here for the Block concert right here Saturday night doing jazz. That's right. Um, <laughs> is a member of, I think founder of, the Harlem Quartet, which is a wonderful quartet of, uh, of very, very versatile musicians. And I've actually worked with them and, and played a concerto with them and got to know Ilmar quite well. And the um, Gavilan part didn't register until I saw <laughs> uh, that you were doing this with Ilmar. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Ravel Concerto. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can say what some of the difficulties are and then just play us something. Oh, well, yeah. well, I have to say this is a very special um, event for me because um, it's going to be the very first time I play this concerto. Uh, I have always wanted to play it and learn it, but I had never got the opportunity to do it. And of course, even more, playing two concertos in one concert is also very, uh, special thing to do. Uh, so for me, it's a, quite a task. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everything about it is hard. <laughs> a lot of notes. <laughs> but um, uh, obviously, I'm very happy to do it. And I, I'm, I think it's going to be very nice. Right. So I think I will play a little bit of um, every movement of the, third, of the concerto, Ravel, just a few passages. That's great. And maybe show us both what's technically, you know, pyrotechnics, incredibly difficult, but also show us what's jazzy about it and what might be, we could hear as being uh, influenced by Gershwin, for example. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, let's start by warming up because I haven't played a note today. <laughs> See if I can play it. So there is one thing here. Okay. 
after this comes this step. And the accent is written not in the first beat, but uh, in the up beat, right? Mm -hmm. So it can, can get really tricky with the conductor and the mm -hmm. orchestra. So we gotta be very uh, on time. You just have to watch me really well. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this sounds kind of um, Cuban too, right? That's very French, actually. <laughs> of Gershwin in there though yeah it's it's so obvious now but I gotta tell you when I first studied the piece I studied it not knowing anything about Ravel or the fact that he was so influenced by American jazz and I was studying it purely as French music it was it unlocked for me when somebody told me yes he was influenced specifically by Gershwin and by Rhapsody in Blue I said of course that's what I can hear in there will you play a little bit of the gorgeous second movement for us of course that's one of the most beautiful lines ever written, right? solo at the very beginning, totally solo, beginning of the second movement, and then the flute comes in with that same solo. Now that movement may not sound too jazzy, there are, or it's too American, but there are moments when um, he's playing a minor key and the bassoon is playing a major key at the same time, for example. Could you play a major chord just so they understand the, and a minor, <laughs> right, and now the major and minor together, right, it's blues, it's bluesy. Because that, which is also the same thing you hear in um, 
in, in Rhapsody in Blue, the major and minor third at the same time. Um, great. Also Let's. This, uh, dual, yeah. dual It's, it's in two keys at the same time. Amazing. Um, play us a little bit of the third movement, which the third movement is a perpetual motion machine, and it's incredibly fast and furious, not just for the piano soloist, but it's fair to say that some of the most difficult orchestral lines in the entire repertoire are in this concerto. For example, if we were ever to hold a bassoon audition, we would definitely put the bassoon solo on the audition. Um, then there are parts for E-flat clarinet and parts for piccolo, Everyone at the very top of their range that are incredibly difficult to play and at the same time incredibly fast. Play a little for us at the third movement. is going crazy, too. Um, so that's the Ravel Piano Concerto. Uh, I, I think, oh, one other thing. It's the only concerto I know of that opens with a whip solo. Now, a whip in an orchestra is played by two pieces of wood that are hinged together like that, but it makes a whip sound. That's the first thing you're going to hear. Very first thing you'll hear is the whip solo. Um, so just a little piece of information for you to drop at your next cocktail party. Um, <laughs> So, very briefly about an American in Paris. Um, Gershwin himself was an American in Paris. Before he became at peace with himself, that he was a great jazz composer, and that his forte was really uh, melding the two, uh, melding jazz and classical. He really tried to be taken seriously as a classical composer. And so he went, because he was rich, he was making a ton of money writing songs and musicals, he went all over the place to seek out the best composers. And one of them was Maurice Ravel. So interestingly, Ravel learned from Gershwin, but Gershwin tried to learn from Ravel. The story goes that um, he went to uh, Paris. He went to Maurice Ravel and said, would you be my teacher? Can I study with you? And Ravel said, how much money are you making? And Gershwin told him his astronomical amount that he was making. And Ravel said, I should be studying with you. <laughs> was, uh, refused to teach him. Um, similarly, Ravel, uh, Gershwin went to Arnold Schoenberg, of all people, the 12 tone composer who at that point had moved to California to, um, uh, uh, as an emigre from Europe. And um, he wanted to study with uh, Schoenberg. And Schoenberg's answer was, I would only make you into a bad Schoenberg and you're such a good Gershwin already. <laughs> and I think that was the smartest thing Arnold Schoenberg ever did, was not try to teach George Gershwin. Anyway, An American in Paris is, as a piece of music, is sort of a, um, a romanticized version of his trip to Europe. And at the very beginning, let's play the very beginning of it, um, you hear what I'm sure depicts a very optimistic, you know, 1920s, 1930s uh, uh, American strolling, actually walking with purpose through the streets of Paris, hearing the taxi horns and so on and all the hustle and bustle around him. Let's listen. <laughs>
So you hear very much Gershwin's American sensibility. What's European about this piece really is the craftsmanship. I think that Gershwin was trying as much as someone like Ravel would do, uh, who is as meticulous as a Swiss watchmaker in putting every note in the right place and a master of orchestration and so on. Gershwin was uh, trying to create a tone poem, uh, which, is a, which is a long and venerable tradition in European music, a tone poem in which a story um, or a mood is depicted in musical notes. And I told the orchestra last night that although this is jazz, we wanted to rehearse it as specifically as if it had been written by Ravel. And I think that really pays wonderful, wonderful benefits uh, to us when you listen to the way the orchestra plays it with, uh, with gusto, but also with, uh, with really specific attention to detail. We'll play one more section for you, which is, I think of it as a love theme. Um, and like Wagner, Gershwin was not afraid to write melodies for the brass. Here's a wonderful one played by the trumpet. <laughs> last night about what could this mean because Gershwin didn't specify exactly what's happening but it's a again a tone poem where a story is being told and we came to the conclusion that maybe this is the love theme that the optimistic American character meets a woman in Paris and falls in love and so the trumpet plays in the most romantic way um, it's an incredibly uh, high-spirited piece um, there are moments of uh, what might cons be considered to be deep feeling but there isn't any sadness or anger or anything like that in the, in the piece. It, the, the, the piece of music spans the entire range of positive emotions from you know, quiet tenderness, passion, love, happiness, celebration. Basically, that's it. Um, if you want sadness, it's, this is really the wrong concert to come to. <laughs> um, now, we end with Rhapsody in Blue, which you all know, yeah? Um, but I have a feeling that Aldo has something to teach all of us about it. Aldo, what do you want to tell us? <laughs> do you want to play a little bit? Yeah, play something in maybe your favorite parts. Right. <clears throat>
so two things. First of all, Muskegon does not need to be taught about uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Anyone who's ever flown in and out of Muskegon, because the only choice is United Airlines, so you know it. <laughs> S secondly, <laughs> but secondly, what you heard Aldo do is add a little bit of his own jazz stylings, which is exactly what Gershwin would have done. And I, I want to make sure that's really clear, that most composers who are also performers, from Chopin, from Mozart, from Bach, um, only wrote down their music so that posterity could have it. But while they played it, they played it a little bit differently every time. Gershwin didn't even write down the solo part to Rhapsody in Blue until after the premiere. It was just in his head. So, um, absolutely, if Gershwin were still playing today, he would, uh, he would be playing it differently. And you told me about some, another spot where you add an actual improv section. That's exactly where I was starting by. Ah, okay, got you. <laughs> you just stopped me there. I stopped you, okay. <laughs> so, but it, that's different every time. You want to just give us a couple minutes of it now? Yeah. Give please. us a couple minutes of it. <laughs> differently uh, on Friday night and uh, you know I think is really nice about that is that Aldo plays in a style that's informed by what went between Gershwin and now in other words there were some elements that probably wouldn't have been used in the 20s but very much uh, with great respect to the music of the 1920s. Um, Rhapsody in Blue was composed as an American or an experiment in new American music um, a concert held in Aeolian Hall. It was Paul Whiteman uh, who set it up. Uh, he asked Gershwin to write a piece for it, 1923-24. Gershwin readily agreed and then readily forgot that he had agreed. And he did not find out that he had agreed to write this piece until he read about it in the paper two weeks before the premiere, or some two or three weeks. And he happened to be on a train between Boston and New York, and he heard the rhythm of the train on the tracks going ba 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 da ba 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 da ba 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 da and that became Rhapsody in Blue. It's, it's just incredible. He said by the time the train reached New York, um, he already had the complete structure as well as the main melodies in his head. So, great. I mean, like Aldo, Gershwin was an amazing uh, improviser uh, and a great talent and um, uh, was able to put this together on very short notice. That's not something that I would have been able to do or indeed anything that Brahms would have been able to do, but it's wonderful that Gershwin had that talent. So those are the four pieces on our concert, and of course you'll also be able to hear Aldo with his brother Ilmar on violin playing jazz uh, on Saturday night here. I hope you'll come to both. Um, we have time for a few questions. Any questions? Yeah. I wish, not anymore. Well, I got my family, which is yeah. around, and uh, I always uh, ask for advices, uh, especially my wife, who happens to be a conductor too, so she knows huh. uh, very good uh, um, advices for me to listen to the orchestra, you know, the spots where we gotta be in touch visually. Um, but no, actually, I don't have a, a teacher anymore. <laughs> um, and it took me around two months to, to get the piece all together and to listen to different versions to make my own because that's the good thing about playing these um, uh, masterworks that you always have to add a little bit of spicy there mm -hmm. of your own, right? Because 
it's been played for many, many great musicians before me that, you know, I'm doing nothing by copying, but just adding some stuff on my own. So that's, that's the main that's idea for me. And that's why we keep changing as we get older, too. Our interpretations keep changing because even though we may come to a very uh, strong conviction or point of view about a piece, we change as human beings as we go through life and, exactly. and our interpretation changes, too. What else? Yes, Michael. Yes. Thank you very much. You know, I also have to say, you told me that your, your conservatory was called the Amadeo Roldan oh, Conservatory. Yes. Um, one of the, well, probably the most celebrated uh, Cuban composer, yeah? Yes, one of Roldan. them. Yeah, one of them. Yes. And um, I've conducted his music. Maybe we'll do some here. Um, a truly great composer, and it's great that they named the conservatory after him. Wonderful. What else? Are there questions? Yes. Yes. It is. I mean, not as popular as popular music <laughs> <laughs> or dance music, but uh, there is a big scene there. We have a, a few um, symphonic orchestras, chamber orchestras, choirs, um, chamber ensembles, and um, yes, there is a, a very interesting uh, scenery there, v v venues and beautiful theaters, not too many good pianos though, <laughs> a couple of them only, and um, there is a, a big audience for it, not a huge audience, but mm. you know, I think that happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that um, there are parts of the world where uh, live music is, is really valued, and um, in my experience in other parts of Latin America, that's one of the things I've noticed that if, if people go to the trouble of playing for you, you really appreciate it, you know, yep. and that's, that's in, in any style, in a popular style or in a classical style. Um, I would love it if the West Michigan Symphony could uh, take a trip to Cuba. I've not mentioned this yet to anyone, <laughs> but, I, but I'm, I'm just saying I'd love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, start a bake sale, yeah. We, uh, you know, I mean, we missed our chance to be the first uh, orchestra to go to Cuba after, uh, after it opened up, but, um, you know, we could, we could probably still be the fourth or fifth, something like that. Oh, um, I would love to be the soloist there. Ah, <laughs> okay. You, we have good ideas. All right, let's make it happen. All right. Um, let's, have, let's have another question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Um, it's the first time I've ever been asked that here, actually. Um, my family influences were mostly due to the fact that my parents loved classical music. Um, my dad is, uh, was, ha has been a jazz clarinetist. He still toots around now and then um, on the side. Uh, my mother studied, of all things, marimba when she was younger. So they both studied music, but mostly it was just recordings of classical music that we heard in the house as I was growing up all the time. And it was just assumed that you would, you know, this is, this is one of the beautiful things that we love about life, is classical music. So, um, but it was not, uh, definitely not clear when I was young that I wanted to be a conductor. Uh, what happened was I was in school and I was playing piano in various chamber groups and I found that I had a lot of ideas and I wanted to, to lead, um, you know, or, or, or maybe come to some decisions on what we would do musically in certain phrases. And then those groups grew and grew and grew, and before I knew it, it was too big for me to just play in, but I had to conduct. So I, I gave up the piano, unfortunately, uh, but in exchange for the, for, for the, you know, 
Rolls Royce of instruments, the orchestra. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to do what I do. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Aldo. Hear him Friday night, come Friday and Saturday. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>